there's a lot of group think and there's a lot of short term thinking there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, those guys are creating web 2.0, which is brilliant. And they're going to create web 3.0 or 4.0, whatever those turn out to be. But the whole focus on making companies that are going to turn into N billion dollar companies and get a million eyeballs or a billion or a trillion eyeballs looking at your website, th- this whole focus, you know, it, it's transforming the world in an important way. On the other hand, it may be overtaken by someone else who's intent on transforming the world in a yet more radical way, you know? Mm-hmm. I see. And th- that could come out of China or somewhere else that's thinking at a left field. I mean, just like Silicon Valley overtook the world by coming out of left field. No one was thinking a couple hackers in their garage were going to kick the world in the ass and change everything. Now everyone is thinking a couple computer hackers in a garage are going to make a website that's going to rule the world. So maybe the next big transformation isn't going to come out of a continuation of that pattern. You know, Maybe it's going to come out of... Uh, is Yaman University in China? You know, I don't even want- yeah, I don't even want to say out of left field because that's a baseball metaphor, right? Which is which is an, which is an American thing. So, yeah, it, it's it's going to come out of mysterious Chinese chi power. That's it. I I don't know. <laughs> Let me uh, just stop you here for a moment and ask you to to help us define and focus on the the main terms that we've been using here for a while now, because some of our viewers may be confused. What is the difference between artificial intelligence? and artificial general intelligence? Uh, the name. No, there's more than that. Uh, <laughs> so the field, of, the field of AI, you know, when the field of AI was founded, it meant AGI, it meant artificial general intelligence. When it was founded in the late 50s and early 60s, these guys were after making human level thinking machines. Yeah. And one of the main lessons that was learned in the decades since is, wow, you know, it's possible to make programs that do stuff that requires vast general intelligence for humans to do them, but the computer program has no general intelligence, and it's just a trick. Like chess. And this wasn't obvious. Yeah, like, like chess, like Google, yeah. Google's search engine, like unmanned automated vehicles that can autopilot for, for a while. I mean, a lot, lot of stuff like that. Hold on, I'm going to go shut my door because my son started playing the piano. I think he's sure, going to hear it. Sure, sure. So I think that was a non-trivial lesson that mm-hmm. narrow AI is possible, right? And since we've learned that lesson that it's possible to achieve some vastly intelligent functions by tricks, then a distinction has to be made between what Ray Kurzweil labeled narrow AI, which is programs that achieve apparently very intelligent functions, but in a highly domain or task specific way, and then general AI, which contains the ability to generalize and transfer knowledge from one domain to another to learn new things that weren't anticipated by the programmer and and so forth. But not everyone accepts this as an important distinction because some folks believe that narrow AI can be progressively grown into general AI. And I don't think that is true. To me, to me that's like, uh, I don't know, it, 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 it's like trying to do space flight by making bouncier and bouncier pogo sticks or something. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you, 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 need, you need a different principle. And I think from the outside world, it may come to appear that AGI comes naturally out of narrow AI. But when you look at the details, it, it, it's not going to be that way, that way at all. I mean, it, you know, if, if Google were to fund AGI, which they're not doing really, then... Potentially, they could release AGI as like, oh, this is a search engine that you chat with rather than one that just gives you web pages. Then to the world at large, it would appear that narrow AI had gradually morphed into general AI. Mm -hmm. But I think if Google were to achieve that, 
it will be because they had some team of people working for five years on building an AGI system quite distinct from, from their whole narrow AI infrastructure. So if Google is not interested in, in funding AGI, would it be DARPA and the military who would be interested in funding it in, in North America? Um, many are interested in funding it in principle. So far, no one is funding it in a serious way in practice. I mean, if you listen to the Google founders, Larry and Sergey talk in speeches, they say Google's an AI company and they do, they do want to build AGI. I mean, th these guys are involved with Singularity University, yeah. you know? Yeah. On the other hand, if you talk to Peter Norvig, who I know, who is their Google's director of research, I mean, he, he thinks it's a bit too early to make a frontal attack on the AGI problem. And that He's we should a kind time of sneak pessimist up. in your paper here. Not even, not even, because he, he thinks we can get it by the middle of the century. He just thinks it's a couple decades too early, not centuries too early. Mm -hmm. So in the paper you're referring to, well, we surveyed various AGI researchers about the time to human level AGI. There was a cluster of folks who thought it would be in the next few decades, yeah. then a cluster who thought it was century, millennia, or trillennia off, you know, and... Norvig would be within the ones who think it'll happen in the next few decades, like within this century. It's Where just Ben Gertz will be it, on the well, timeline compared with the rest of the experts. Did you do the 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 questionnaire yourself? I I did. I, I was not the most optimistic, but I, I was one of the more optimistic. I mean, I I think we can have human level AGI, say within five and 30 years, depending on the amount of funding and attention that, that goes into the problem. So that's, I would say, fairly optimistic kind of a time span, thir three decades from now. I think that's fairly optimistic. We'll be around to see it. I hope so. You, you never know. I mean, the, 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 there's always the possibility of a narrow AI engineered uh, virus that, that annihilates us all. Well, speaking, speaking of annihilation, um, let me ask you this. Uh, so, first of all, what's the correlation that you see between the creation of artificial general intelligence and the singularity? And second of all, what do you rate our chances of surviving it are, like in terms of percentage-wise? Oh, first of all, I think that artificial general intelligence is very likely to be what launches the singularity. Mm -hmm. So I, I buy into I.J. Good's notion of the singularity as an intelligence explosion. explosion. Yeah. I don't think it's the only possible way, but I think it's the most likely possible way. And that if some other technology like genetic engineering, brain enhancement, or nanotech advances faster than AI... I think that technology will, in short order, be used to make AGI, which will then cause the next big burst, uh, accelerating things toward and beyond the singularity. And then what would and be our chances of surviving it then? I think my, my confidence interval for that is, is very wide. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any basis to make a, a detailed rational estimate of that. I also think the question isn't well posed. What does it mean for us to survive it? Does it mean for humans in their precise form. legacy form to survive? Yeah. Or do, does it mean that we get to fuse with the super intelligent overmind in a way that we can experience and enjoy and kind of re respects our integrity and experience? Well, Kevin Warwick, for example, let me elaborate a little more so see if we can get it. Um, Kevin Warwick, for example, has a very, very low estimate of our chances of surviving any singularity in our current form. He's, he says that humanity is absolutely doomed. What he believes in, however, is that our merging with machines would allow us to survive it and go beyond on the other end of the singularity in a radically new form, either as cyborgs 
or as some sort of a machine enhanced super intelligent augmented beings or something like that. So as long in my view, as long as there's some kind of continuity between Ben and Nick here and their sort of augmented uh, resulting beings which were augmented by technology on top of that and there's some kind of continuity between our memory and our experience and our knowledge, I would believe that even though biologically we may not be the same, if there's a continuity then we have survived it. That, that's my personal take on it. Well, I think the class of futures that Kevin Warwick discusses are plausible ones that may happen. But I think Werner Vinge got it right when he said, after we have minds that are dozens of times smarter than us, none of us can really predict what the fuck is going to happen. And that, that's the bottom line. I mean, the confidence intervals is pretty wide. Kevin Warwick, he can say, if he wants to, that the human race is doomed. But how, how can he really know that? I mean, maybe, maybe I will build or someone else will build a sort of AI babysitter, which is very smart and very powerful, and will protect an enclave of legacy humans because it's programmed to do so. Yeah, but the I mean, impact how, on the how, future how you, world would be minimal. I mean, right? That's, I a, mean, separate, that's a separate issue as to than whether we survive or not. Mm, I see. I see. All right. Uh, I think we're coming very close to the end of our interview, so let me ask you the last two questions. Uh, first of all, if uh, our viewers and listeners want to find out more information about you, what are the best sources? Where should they go to look for, for that? My website, gertzel.org has links to the various projects I'm involved with and li links to my uh, Twitter feed and, uh, and my email address and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, okay. And then um, if you have one message that you want to get across to all of the people who are going to see this video, what would you like it to be? That the future is ours to create. The singularity is not inevitable. A positive singularity is not inevitable. As, as far as we know, not much is inevitable. <laughs> and seemingly fanciful things like AGI, human immortality, mind uploading, an end to poverty, scarcity, and disease we're, we're fortunate enough to be living at a historical moment where these things are likely achievable for the first time in our lives. And most likely these things are going to be achieved by some small groups of people working really hard on them. And whatever your specific talents or tastes are, there's probably a good way for you to contribute toward one of these really important things and thus bias the odds of all of us surviving the singularity in a, in a positive way. That's fantastic. So my take on this would be if you can do a blog and interview Ben Gertzel, do so. If you have a bank account with a hundred billion dollars, then, by all means, yeah, yeah, we, we, we didn't we, contact information already. We, we, we didn't get into my plan for how to spend a hundred billion dollars, <laughs> but we can, we, 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 can, we can do that in another interview anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Ben, thanks a lot for uh, coming to all speak right. to Singularity One on One. Today. Yeah, thank, thanks for interviewing me. It's good fun. Bye bye.